Welcome to All Things Eerie, a collection of spooky tales brought to you by the Nashville Public Library. Here we welcome the unwelcome, try to settle the unsettling, and play host to the undeparted, the undead, and, shall we say, the unreasonable. As we enter the land of shadows and uncertainty, the twilight of your imagination, relax while we pull aside the curtain. Indeed, lift the veil of the secret and unknown. And don't look around too much. It's bad for the nerves. Pull your blanket tight around you and make way for this evening's selection. Welcome back to All Things Eerie. Richard Barham Middleton was an English poet and author who is remembered mostly for his short ghost stories, in particular, The Ghost Ship. Middleton suffered from severe depression, then termed melancholia. He spent his last nine months in Brussels, where in December 1911, at age 29, he took his life by poisoning himself with chloroform, which had been prescribed as a remedy for his condition. Poor fellow. He did leave us, however, with a few jewels from his yet budding genius, and one of tonight's stories, On the Brighton Road, is one of my favorite stories because of its having so many elements of a good ghost story. A tramp freezing in the cold, and, of course, the restless dead. The brevity of the story is countered by a surprise ending that stops the reader for an uncomfortable contemplation. May yours be brief. And now, turn down the lights and join us for two classics, The Ghost Ship and On the Brighton Road by Richard Middleton. The Ghost Ship Fairfield is a little village lying near the Portsmouth Road, about halfway between London and the sea. Strangers who find it by accident now and then call it a pretty, old-fashioned place. We who live in it and call it home don't find anything very pretty about it, but we should be very sorry to live anywhere else. Our minds have taken the shape of the inn and the church and the green, I suppose. At all events, we never feel comfortable outside of Fairfield. Of course, the Cockneys, with their vasty houses and noise-ridden streets, can call us rustics if they choose, but for all that, Fairfield is a better place to live in than London. Doctor says that when he goes to London, his mind is bruised with the weight of the houses, and he was a Cockney born. He had to live there himself when he was a little chap, but he knows better now. You gentlemen may laugh. Perhaps some of you come from London way, but it seems to me that a witness like that is worth a gallon of arguments. Dull? Well, you might find it dull, but I assure you that I've listened to all the London yarns you have spun tonight, and they're absolutely nothing to the things that happen at Fairfield. It's because of our way of thinking and minding our own business. If one of your Londoners were set down on the green of a Saturday night, when the ghosts of the lads who died in the war keep tryst with the lasses who lie in the churchyard, he couldn't help being curious and interfering and then the ghosts would go somewhere where it was quieter. But we just let them come and go and don't make any fuss, and in consequence Fairfield is the ghostliest place in all England. Why, I've seen a headless man sitting on the edge of the well in broad daylight, and the children playing about his feet as if he were their father. Take my word for it, spirits know when they are well off as much as human beings. Still, I must admit that the thing I'm going to tell you about was queer even for our part of the world, where three packs of ghost hounds hunt regularly during the season, and Blacksmith's great-grandfather is busy all night shooing the dead gentleman's horses. Now that's a thing that wouldn't happen in London, because of their interfering ways. But Blacksmith, he lies up aloft and sleeps as quiet as a lamb. Once, when he had a bad head, he shouted down to them not to make so much noise, and in the morning he found an old guinea left on the anvil as an apology. He wears it on his watch-chain now, but I must get on with my story, 
If I start telling you about the queer happenings at Fairfield, I'll never stop. It all came of the great storm in the spring of 97, the year that we had two great storms. This was the first one, and I remember it very well, because I found in the morning that it had lifted the thatch of my pigsty into the widow's garden as clean as a boy's kite. When I looked over the hedge, widow, Tom Lamport's widow, that was, was prodding for her nasturtiums with a daisy grubber. After I had watched her for a little while, I went down to the fox and grapes to tell landlord what she had said to me. Landlord, he laughed, being a married man and at ease with the sex. Come to that, he said. The tempest has blown something into the field. A kind of ship, I think it would be. I was surprised at that until he explained that it was only a ghost ship and would do no hurt to the turnips. We argued that it had been blown up from the sea at Portsmouth, and then we talked of something else. There were two slates down at the parsonage and a big tree in Lumley's Meadow. It was a rare storm. I reckon the wind had blown our ghosts all over England. They were coming back for days afterward with foundered horses and as footsore as possible, and they were so glad to get back to Fairfield that some of them walked up the street crying like little children. Squire said that his great-grandfather's great-grandfather hadn't looked so dead beat since the Battle of Naseby, and he's an educated man. What with one thing and another, I should think it was a week before we got straight again, and then one afternoon I met the landlord on the green, and he had a worried face. "'I wish you'd come and have a look at that ship in my field,' he said to me. "'It seems to me it's leaning real hard on the turnips. I can't bear thinking what the missus will say when she sees it.' I walked down the lane with him, and sure enough there was a ship in the middle of his field, but such a ship as no man had seen on the water for three hundred years, let alone in the middle of a turnip field. It was all painted black and covered with carvings, and there was a great bay window in the stern for all the world like the squire's drawing room. There was a crowd of little black cannon on deck and looking out of her portholes, and she was anchored at each end to the hard ground. I have seen the wonders of the world on picture postcards, but I have never seen anything to equal that. "'She seems very solid for a ghost ship,' I said, seeing the landlord was bothered. "'I should say it's betwixt and between,' he answered, puzzling it over. "'But it's going to spoil a matter of fifty turnips, and Mrs. She'll want it moved.' We went up to her and touched the side, and it was as hard as a real ship. "'Now there's folks in England would call that very curious,' he said. Now, I don't know much about ships, but I should think that the ghost ship weighed a solid two hundred tons, and it seemed to me that she had come to stay, so that I felt sorry for the landlord, who was a married man. All the horses in Fairfield won't move her out of my turnips, he said, frowning at her. Just then we heard a noise on her deck, and we looked up and saw that a man had come out of her front cabin and was looking down at us very peaceably. He was dressed in a black uniform set out with rusty gold lace, and he had a great cutlass by his side in a brass sheath. "'I'm Captain Bartholomew Roberts,' he said, in a gentleman's voice. "'Put in for recruits. I seem to have brought her rather far up the harbor.' "'Harbor?' cried Landlord. "'Why, you're fifty miles from the sea.' Captain Roberts didn't turn a hair. "'So much as that, is it?' he said coolly. Well, it's of no consequence. Landlord was a bit upset at this. I don't want to be unneighborly, he said, but I wish you hadn't brought your ship into my field. You see, my wife sets great store on these turnips. The captain took a pinch of snuff out of a fine gold box that he pulled out of his pocket and dusted his fingers with a silk handkerchief in a very genteel fashion. I'm only here for a few months, he said, but if a testimony of my esteem would pacify your good lady, I should be content, and with these words he loosed a great gold brooch from the neck of his coat and tossed it down to the landlord. Landlord blushed as red as a strawberry. I'm not denying she's fond of jewelry, he said, but it's too much for half a sack full of turnips. 
and indeed it was a handsome brooch. The captain laughed. Tut, man, he said, it's a forced sale, and you deserve a good price. Say no more about it. And nodding good day to us, he turned on his heel and went into the cabin. Landlord walked back up the lane like a man with a weight off his mind. That tempest has blowed me a bit of luck, he said. The missus will be main pleased with that brooch. It's better than a blacksmith's guinea any day. Ninety-seven was Jubilee, the year of the second Jubilee, you remember, and we had great doings at Fairfield, so that we hadn't much time to bother about the ghost ship, though anyhow it isn't our way to meddle in things that don't concern us. Landlord, he saw his tenant once or twice when he was hoeing the turnips and passed the time of day, and Landlord's wife wore her new brooch to church every Sunday. But we didn't mix much with the ghosts at any time, all except a lad there was in the village, and he didn't know the difference between a man and a ghost, poor innocent. On Jubilee Day, however, somebody told Captain Roberts why the church bells were ringing, and he hoisted a flag and fired off his guns like a loyal Englishman. Tis true the guns were shotted, and one of the round shot knocked a hole in Farmer Johnstone's barn, but nobody thought much of that in such a season of rejoicing. It wasn't till our celebrations were over that we noticed that anything was wrong in Fairfield. Twas Shoemaker who told me first about it one morning at the Fox and Grapes. You know my great-great-uncle, he said to me. You mean Joshua, the quiet lad, I answered, knowing him well. Quiet, said Shoemaker indignantly. Quiet, you call him, coming home at three o'clock every morning as drunk as a magistrate and waking up the whole house with his noise. Why, it can't be Joshua, I said, for I knew him for one of the most respectable young ghosts in the village. Joshua it is, said Shoemaker, and one of these nights he'll find himself out in the street if he isn't careful. This kind of talk shocked me, I can tell you, for I don't like to hear a man abusing his own family, and I could hardly believe that a steady youngster like Joshua had taken to drink. But just then in came Butcher Aylwin in such a temper that he could hardly drink his beer. The young puppy! The young puppy! he kept saying, and it was some time before Shoemaker and I found out that he was talking about his ancestor that fell at Senlac. Drink? said Shoemaker hopefully, for we all like company in our misfortunes. And Butcher nodded grimly. The young noodle! he said, emptying his tankard. Well, after that I kept my ears open, and it was the same story all over the village. There was hardly a young man among all the ghosts of Fairfield who didn't roll home in the small hours of the morning the worse for liquor. I used to wake up in the night and hear them stumble past my house, singing outrageous songs. The worst of it was that we couldn't keep the scandal to ourselves, and the folk at Greenhill began to talk of sodden Fairfield, and taught their children to sing a song about us. Sodden Fairfield, sodden Fairfield, has no use for bread and butter, rum for breakfast, rum for dinner, rum for tea, and rum for supper. We are easy going in our village, but we didn't like that. Of course we soon found out where the young fellows went to get the drink, and landlord was terribly cut up that his tenant should have turned out so badly, but his wife wouldn't hear of parting with the brooch, so that he couldn't give the captain notice to quit. But as time went on, things grew from bad to worse, and at all hours of the day you would see the young reprobates sleeping it off on the village green. Nearly every afternoon a ghost wagon used to jolt down to the ship with a lading of rum, and though the older ghosts seemed inclined to give the captain's hospitality the go-by, the youngsters were neither to hold nor to bind. So one afternoon, when I was taking my nap, I heard a knock at the door, and there was Parson, looking very serious, like a man with a job before him that he didn't altogether relish. "'I'm going down to talk to the captain about all this drunkenness in the village, and I want you to come with me,' he said straight out. I can't say that I fancied the visit much myself, and I tried to hint to Parson that as, after all, there were only a lot of ghosts, it didn't very much matter.' 
Dead or alive, I'm responsible for their good conduct, he said. And I'm going to do my duty and put a stop to this continued disorder. And you are coming with me, John Simmons. So I went, Parson being a persuasive kind of man. We went down to the ship, and as we approached her, I could see the captain tasting the air on deck. When he saw Parson, he took off his hat politely, and I can tell you that I was relieved to find that he had a proper respect for the cloth. Parson acknowledged his salute and spoke out stoutly enough. Sir, I should be glad to have a word with you. Come on board, sir, come on board, said the captain, and I could tell by his voice that he knew why we were there. Parson and I climbed up an uneasy kind of ladder, and the captain took us into the great cabin at the back of the ship where the bay window was. It was the most wonderful place you ever saw in your life, all full of gold and silver plate, swords with jeweled scabbards, carved oak chairs, and great chests that looked as though they were bursting with guineas. Even Parson was surprised and he did not shake his head very hard when the captain took down some silver cups and poured us out a drink of rum. I tasted mine, and I don't mind saying that it changed my view of things entirely. There was nothing betwixt and between about that rum, and I felt that it was ridiculous to blame the lads for drinking too much of stuff like that. It seemed to fill my veins with honey and fire. Parson put the case squarely to the captain but I didn't listen much to what he said. I was busy sipping my drink and looking through the window at the fishes swimming to and fro over landlord's turnips. Just then it seemed the most natural thing in the world that they should be there, though afterwards, of course, I could see that that proved it was a ghost ship. But even then I thought it was queer when I saw a drowned sailor float by in the thin air with his hair and beard all full of bubbles. It was the first time I had seen anything quite like that at Fairfield. All the time I was regarding the wonders of the deep, Parson was telling Captain Roberts how there was no peace or rest in the village owing to the curse of drunkenness, and what a bad example the youngsters were setting to the older ghosts. The captain listened very attentively, and only put in a word now and then about boys and young men sowing their wild oats. But when Parson had finished his speech, he filled up our silver cups and said to Parson with a flourish, I should be sorry to cause trouble anywhere where I have been made welcome, and you will be glad to hear that I put to sea tomorrow night. And now you must drink me a prosperous voyage. So we all stood up and drank the toast with honor, and that noble rum was like hot oil in my veins. After that, Captain showed us some of the curiosities he had brought back from foreign parts, and we were greatly amazed, though afterwards I couldn't clearly remember what they were. And then I found myself walking across the turnips with Parson, and I was telling him of the glories of the deep that I had seen through the window of the ship. He turned on me severely. If I were you, John Simmons, he said, I should go straight home to bed. He has a way of putting things that wouldn't occur to an ordinary man, has Parson, and I did as he told me. Well, next day it came on to blow, and it blew harder and harder still, till about eight o'clock at night I heard a noise and looked out into the garden. I dare say you won't believe me. It seems a bit tall even to me, but the wind had lifted the thatch of my pigsty into the widow's garden a second time. I thought I wouldn't wait to hear what Widow had to say about it, so I went across the green to the fox and grapes, and the wind was so strong that I danced along on tiptoe like a girl at the fair. When I got to the inn, Landlord had to help me shut the door. It seemed as though a dozen goats were pushing against it to come in out of the storm. "'It's a powerful tempest,' he said, drawing the beer. "'I hear there's a chimney down at Dickory End.' It's a funny thing how these sailors know about the weather, I answered. When Captain said he was going tonight, I was thinking it would take a capful of wind to carry the ship back to sea, but now here's more than a capful. Ah, yes, said Landlord. It's tonight he goes, true enough, and mind you, though he treated me handsome over the rent, 
I'm not sure it's a loss to the village. I don't hold with gentrists who fetch their drink from London instead of helping local traders to get their living. But you haven't got any rum like his, I said to draw him out. His neck grew red above his collar, and I was afraid I'd gone too far. But after a while he got his breath with a grunt. John Simmons, he said, if you've come down here this windy night to talk a lot of fool's talk, you've wasted a journey. Well, of course, then I had to smooth him down with praising his rum, and heaven forgive me for swearing it was better than Captain's, for the like of that rum no living lips have tasted save mine and Parson's. But somehow or other I brought Landlord round, and presently we must have a glass of his best to prove its quality. Beat that if you can, he cried, and we both raised our glasses to our mouths, only to stop halfway and look at each other in amaze for the wind that had been howling outside like an outrageous dog had all of a sudden turned as melodious as the carol boys of a Christmas Eve. "'Surely that's not my Martha,' whispered Landlord, Martha being his great aunt that lived in the loft overhead. We went to the door, and the wind burst it open so that the handle was driven clean into the plaster of the wall. But we didn't think about that at the time.' for over our heads, sailing very comfortably through the windy stars, was the ship that had passed the summer in Landlord's Field. Her portholes and her bay window were blazing with lights, and there was a noise of singing and fiddling on her decks. "'He's gone!' shouted Landlord above the storm. "'And he's taken half the village with him!' I could only nod in answer, not having lungs like bellows of leather." In the morning we were able to measure the length of the storm, and over and above my pigsty there was damage enough wrought in the village to keep us busy. True it is that the children had to break down no branches for the firing that autumn, since the wind had strewn the woods with more than they could carry away. Many of our ghosts were scattered abroad, but this time very few came back, all the young men having sailed with Captain. And not only ghosts— for a poor half-witted lad was missing, and we reckoned that he had stowed himself away or perhaps shipped as cabin boy not knowing any better. What with the lamentations of the ghost girls and the grumblings of families who had lost an ancestor, the village was upset for a while. And the funny thing was that it was the folk who had complained most of the carryings on of the youngsters who made most noise now that they were gone. I hadn't any sympathy with shoemaker or butcher, who ran about saying how much they missed their lads, but it made me grieve to hear the poor bereaved girls calling their lovers by name on the village green at nightfall. It didn't seem fair to me that they should have lost their men a second time, after giving up life in order to join them, as like as not. Still, not even a spirit can be sorry forever, and after a few months we made up our mind that the folk who had sailed in the ship were never coming back, and we didn't talk about it any more. And then one day, I dare say it would be a couple of years after, when the whole business was quite forgotten, who should come traipsing along the road from Portsmouth but the daft lad who had gone away with the ship without waiting till he was dead to become a ghost? You never saw such a boy as that in all your life. He had a great rusty cutlass hanging on a string at his waist, and he was tattooed all over in fine colors, so that even his face looked like a girl's sampler. He had a handkerchief in his hand full of foreign shells and old-fashioned pieces of small money, very curious, and he walked up to the well outside his mother's house and drew himself a drink as if he had been nowhere in particular. The worst of it was that he had come back as soft-headed as he went, and try as we might, we couldn't get anything reasonable out of him. He talked a lot of gibberish about keel-hauling and walking the plank and crimson murders things, which a decent sailor should know nothing about, so that it seemed to me that for all his manners, Captain had been more of a pirate than a gentleman mariner. But to draw sense out of that boy was as hard as picking cherries off a crab tree. One silly tale he had that he kept on drifting back to, and to hear him you would have thought that it was the only thing that happened to him in his life. We was at anchor, he would say. 
off an island called the Basket of Flowers, and the sailors had caught a lot of parrots, and we were teaching them to swear. Up and down the decks, up and down the decks, and the language they used was dreadful. Then we looked up and saw the masts of the Spanish ship outside the harbor. Outside the harbor they were, so we threw the parrots into the sea and sailed out to fight. And all the parrots were drowned in the sea, and the language they used was dreadful. That's the sort of boy he was, nothing but silly talk of parrots when we asked him about fighting. And we never had a chance of teaching him better, for two days after he ran away again, and hasn't been seen since. That's my story, and I assure you that things like that are happening at Fairfield all the time. The ship has never come back, but somehow as people grow older, they seem to think that one of these windy nights she'll come sailing in over the hedges with all the lost ghosts on board. Well, when she comes, she'll be welcome. There's one ghost lass that has never grown tired of waiting for her lad to return. Every night you'll see her out on the green, straining her poor eyes with looking for the mast lights among the stars. A faithful lass, you'd call her, and I'm thinking you'd be right. Landlord's Field wasn't a penny the worse for the visit, but they do say that since then the turnips that have been grown in it have tasted of rum. On the Brighton Road Slowly the sun had climbed up the hard white downs, till it broke with little of the mysterious ritual of dawn upon a sparkling world of snow. There had been a hard frost during the night, and the birds, who hopped about here and there with scant tolerance of life, left no trace of their passage on the silver pavements. In places the sheltered caverns of the hedges broke the monotony of the whiteness that had fallen upon the colored earth, and overhead the sky melted from orange to deep blue, from deep blue to a blue so pale that it suggested a thin paper screen rather than illimitable space. Across the level fields there came a cold, silent wind, which blew a fine dust of snow from the trees, but hardly stirred the crested hedges. Once above the skyline, the sun seemed to climb more quickly, and as it rose higher it began to give out a heat that blended with the keenness of the wind. It may have been this strange alternation of heat and cold that disturbed the tramp in his dreams, for he struggled for a moment with the snow that covered him, like a man who finds himself twisted uncomfortably in the bedclothes, and then sat up with staring, questioning eyes. "'Lord, I thought I was in bed,' he said to himself as he took in the vacant landscape, "'and all the while I was out here.' He stretched his limbs, and rising carefully to his feet, shook the snow off his body. And as he did so, the wind set him shivering, and he knew that his bed had been warm. "'Come, I feel pretty fit,' he thought. "'I suppose I am lucky to wake it all in this, "'or unlucky it isn't much of a business to come back to.' He looked up and saw the downs shining against the blue like the Alps on a picture postcard. That means another forty miles or so, I suppose, he continued grimly. Lord knows what I did yesterday. Walked till I was done, and now I'm only about twelve miles from Brighton. Damn the snow! Damn Brighton! Damn everything! The sun crept higher and higher, and he started walking patiently along the road with his back turned to the hills. Am I glad or sorry that it was only sleep that took me? Glad or sorry? Glad or sorry? His thoughts seemed to arrange themselves in a metrical accompaniment to the steady thud of his footsteps, and he hardly sought an answer to his question. It was good enough to walk to. Presently, when three milestones had loitered past, he overtook a boy who was stooping to light a cigarette. He wore no overcoat and looked unspeakably fragile against the snow. "'Are you on the road, Governor?' asked the boy huskily as he passed. "'I think I am,' the tramp said. "'Oh, then I'll come a bit of the way with you if you don't walk too fast. "'It's a bit lonesome walking this time of day.' The tramp nodded his head, and the boy started limping along by his side. "'I'm eighteen, he said casually. 
I bet you thought I was younger. Fifteen, I'd have said. You'd have backed a loser. Eighteen last August, and I'd been on the road six years. I ran away from home five times when I was a little un, and the police took me back each time. Very good to me, the police was. Now I haven't got a home to run away from. Nor have I, the tramp said calmly. Oh, I can see what you are, the boy panted. You're a gentleman come down. It's harder for you than for me. The tramp glanced at the limping, feeble figure and lessened his pace. I haven't been at it as long as you have, he admitted. No, I could tell that by the way you walk. You haven't got tired yet. Perhaps you expect something at the other end? The tramp reflected for a moment. I don't know, he said bitterly. I'm always expecting things. You'll grow out of that, the boy commented. It's warmer in London, but it's harder to come by grub. There isn't much in it, really. Still, there's the chance of meeting somebody there who will understand. Country people are better, the boy interrupted. Last night I took a lease of a barn for nothing and slept with the cows, and this morning the farmer routed me out and gave me tea and toke because I was so little. Of course I score there, but in London, soup on the embankment at night and all the rest of the time coppers moving you on. I dropped by the roadside last night and slept where I fell. It's a wonder I didn't die, the tramp said. The boy looked at him sharply. How do you know you didn't? He said. I don't see it, the tramp said after a pause. I tell you, the boy said hoarsely, people like us can't get away from this sort of thing if we want to. Always hungry and thirsty and dog-tired and walking all the time. And yet if anyone offers me a nice home and work, my stomach feels sick. Do I look strong? I know I'm little for my age, but I've been knocking about like this for six years. And do you think I'm not dead? I was drowned bathing at Margate, and I was killed by a gypsy with a spike. He knocked my head right in. And twice I was froze like you last night, and a motor cut me down on this very road. And yet I'm walking along here now, walking to London to walk away from it again, because I can't help it. Dead! I tell you, we can't get away if we want to. The boy broke off in a fit of coughing, and the tramp paused while he recovered. You'd better borrow my coat for a bit, Tommy, he said. Your cough's pretty bad. You go to hell, the boy said fiercely, puffing at his cigarette. I'm all right. I was telling you about the road. You haven't got down to it yet, but you'll find out presently. We're all dead, all of us who are on it, and we're all tired, yet somehow we can't leave it. There's nice smells in the summer, dust and hay and the wind smack in your face on a hot day, and it's nice waking up in the wet grass on a fine morning. I don't know. I don't know. He lurched forward suddenly, and the tramp caught him in his arms. I'm sick, the boy whispered. Sick. The tramp looked up and down the road, but he could see no houses or any sign of help. Yet even as he supported the boy doubtfully in the middle of the road, a motor car suddenly flashed in the middle distance and came smoothly through the snow. "'What's the trouble?' said the driver quietly as he pulled up. "'I'm a doctor.' He looked at the boy keenly and listened to his strained breathing. "'Pneumonia,' he commented. "'I'll give him a lift to the infirmary, and you too, if you like.' The tramp thought of the workhouse and shook his head. I'd rather walk, he said. The boy winked faintly as they lifted him into the car. I'll meet you beyond Rygate, he murmured to the tramp. You'll see. And the car vanished along the white road. All the morning the tramp splashed through the thawing snow. But at midday he begged some bread at a cottage door and crept into a lonely barn to eat it. It was warm in there, and after his meal he fell asleep among the hay. It was dark when he woke and started trudging once more through the slushy roads. Two miles beyond Rygate, a figure, a fragile figure, slipped out of the darkness to meet him. "'On the road, Governor,' said a husky voice. "'Then I'll come a bit of the way with you if you don't walk too fast. 
It's a bit lonesome walking this time of day. But the pneumonia, cried the tramp, aghast. I died at Crawley this morning, said the boy. Thanks for being with us and for listening to All Things Eerie. For more shivers, stories, and episodes, visit the Nashville Public Library website at library.nashville.org. Feel free to leave requests or suggestions. Original music for this podcast is by Dawn Northwind and was produced and recorded by Adam Dean. Art design is by Allison Price. NPL Studio Engineering is by Forrest Eagle, all of whom, with me, send their very best wishes to you for a very good night.